that's basically like macro and crypto, those two things will converge. That's going to become one and the same thing. It's just a, it's a fast convergence, but people might not see it coming. What have we seen over the last nine months in the macro story of crypto? Has there been more of that convergence? Are they now close to one and the same or what's changed? So I think they're the same. So if I go to my peer group and the people I really respect from macro hedge fund space, right? So that's the pointy end of macro. Those are the guys, almost all of them have transitioned across in one way, shape or form, either entirely or partially. Really? So like, yeah, I mean, it's very Is that like famous the last nine months or how long been has it happening been happening slowly, but it's increasing, you know, it's going exponential as all these trends do. So, you know, people like Alan Howard, who's one of the world's most famous macro investors based out of the UK, he personally is entirely crypto now. You know, Dan Tapiero, wow. you know, good friend of mine, he's entirely crypto now. I'm pretty much entirely crypto. Certainly my investments are, I still look at them whole macro world. But one after the other, they're all seeing the superior returns and a solution for the set of problem, macro problems. So macro guys generally tend to be pretty pragmatic. We've got a set of problems, solutions, what's going to make money, allocate capital accordingly. But everybody's going, well, this is the biggest opportunity we've ever seen because you start, everybody starts on the Bitcoin journey and ends up going, having the holy shit moment that everything is about to change. And I'm sure we'll talk about a lot of that later. So I think macro and crypto have merged. What you're seeing now is you're seeing a lot of noise from the latecomers to macro. People who only know either the latecomers from macro or the ones that have been around very long and are anchored to gold and certain kind of mean reverting ideas. What you're seeing is a fear of change. So the noise that you're getting at the periphery, the Peter Schiff's of this world, for example, is not that Peter Schiff doesn't understand that crypto is the future it's that he doesn't want it to be because it's technology it's fun. we call that we call that bag bias is that what you're saying <laughs> I, it's actually worse than bag bias it's a fear of change right we're going through the fastest change in all history so for people to understand what i'm talking about the internet grew at 63 percent a year from 1990 to 2000. the internet was 140 million users at 1997 ish Crypto is about the same now. But the crypto digital asset space is growing at 113% a year. This is the fastest adoption of any technology in all recorded history. People don't want to believe it. How can my very system of money change in front of my eyes? What, what does the central bank mean any longer? What does it mean for my savings? What does it mean for, you know, the thing that I've railed about all the time is gold, that'll save you from all of this. And now there's something else. Everyone has to drop so much of their kind of outward facing belief system and it's hard so that is the that will slowly change over time but generally the macro people who are broad-minded have entirely changed how did i get here and my journey was i was macro macro for 30 years it was 1997 where the world changed 97 and 98 was the asian crisis the asian crisis was a sovereign debt crisis and a corporate debt crisis that wiped off the value of Asian stock markets by 90%, currencies collapsed 80%. It was a total wipeout of wealth in Asia. And it was driven by debt. The answer to 1997 and 98 was to cut interest rates. Long-term capital management, the giant hedge fund blew up at that time as well. The answer to that, because it could have taken down the financial system, was to cut rates. That led to, firstly, a massive rally in equities and pouring of money into the internet boom. So that was a VC led rally plus all the stocks. That obviously ends up morphing into where we are today. The inter you know, crypto could not have happened without the internet. But what happened over that period is a massive debt bubble in property. So the debt bubble continued. It in fact accelerated. Then it blew up the entire world's banking system in 2008. Nobody knew who'd, who'd owned what. So when Lehman went under, everyone's like, well, I don't know. How do I get my stuff back? And they're like, well, it's not your stuff. It's been rehypothecated 37 times. So you can fight it out in courts. And oh, by the way, it's held in the Cayman Islands, London, New York, and Hong Kong. Figure it out yourselves, right? That was the mess we got into. And people got wiped out. Then we cut interest rates to zero and invented quantitative easing, which the Japanese had been kind of trialing beforehand. So now we're pushing money into the banking system and we have rates at zero. 
And so humans being humans go, well, great, we'll just borrow more money. And they just keep borrowing money. So all of us in macro have been watching this and talking about it for a long time, 20 years, long time. And we knew, you know, business cycles only come along once every five to eight years. And it all comes to a head in a recession. So 2008, you kind of knew was coming because of what had happened in 2000 and what had happened in 97. And the piper was going to get paid and the central bank figured a way out of it. Then suddenly this event happens last year. There was going to be a recession, but the accelerant was the pandemic. So it blows up everything and the world could have blown up again, right? All Everybody should have gone insolvent because the world shut down for a year. But the government just said, no, here, take free money and the central bank will just print it. So we now know what it's doing to the value of our savings because these assets are going up. We're actually getting poorer in our future selves. And so the macro guys start thinking, well, how the hell are we going to get out of this cycle? It's either going to blow up spectacularly, but the odds are getting less, or we're just going to get poorer slowly over time. So it's a matter of how fast you figure out what's going on. So once you figure out what's going on, you look at crypto and it solves a lot of this. So when Bitcoin first comes along, it's clear it's developed solely for this job. I mean, it's very clear in the white paper and it's very clear when they're looking at the banks being bailed out again, that somebody figures out, why don't we try a scarce digital asset and see if that works? And then about a year or two after that, people start figuring out, oh, blockchain. Oh, that kind of is interesting for other stuff because we've got a, now a trusted ownership structure, which the world didn't have. Then Europe blows up in 2012 as well. We almost lost the whole of the European Union and all of the banks. So we kind of know it's a big problem. And then Ethereum comes along with smart contracts and then the kind of light bulb moment for everybody goes off is like, actually, we can rebuild the entire system from scratch. So as a macro guy, when you know you've got something fundamentally broken and there's only one set of outcomes, which is printing more money, we've got this low growth from this demographics and technology and all of these things that have been changing the world. So we've got, we've got low growth, massive debt, makes it harder to service the debt, increases the amount of printing, so therefore, these assets go up. But the real macro opportunity is to invest in the new world. We've just discovered the Americas from scratch. Why would you not buy that? Because it actually answers all of the problems. It's got the scarcity. It's got the ownership, the transference. It's a new system. It doesn't have the fragilities of the old system. You know, and then the macro story gets better because it's like, you know, if you remember, go back nine months, go back maybe 18 months. I was like, we need a yield curve. Four months later, DeFi explodes. And it's kind of this different yield curves everywhere and different risk curves and God knows what. And then ETH and staking comes along and we've got now got a risk-free yield. I mean, we've got everything we need. So this becomes a macro bet now. So how do you analyze a macro bet? Because for me, I can't understand all of the protocols or, you know, look at every single token, think about everything. 